begin. So <clears throat> let's begin our discussion on introduction to medical microbiology. I am Walter Waswa, so I'll be taking you through this course and of course introduction to immunology as well. So when you're talking about microbiology, basically you're talking about microorganisms, things that cannot be seen with uh, an aided eye. So you have to be use, of course, a microscope, a lens, so that you can see most of these organisms. They are very small and quite adapted to the environment where they colonize and inhabit. So uh, the areas, of course, it is our body. So like we have specific microorganisms that affect the respiratory system and they are specifically suited to adapt, uh, infect that area. And there are those that affect the, the urinary system. There are those that affect, of course, the, the urinary and reproductive system, the GIT. All these have specific adaptation that help them to be able to uh, live and multiply within that system. So what you can see before you is a group of uh, so many organisms. Uh, I like not to leave things uh, untouched. So I'll just explain a little bit some of them is that one of it is a bacteria. If you can see this one, you should be able to associate it with a bacteria. So this is a bacteria. It has some growth extension towards the back. And as you read more, you'll be able to tell to, to I'll realize that this extension towards the path I helps this bacteria to move up and down. And those are actually specifically adapted to uh, the bacteria so that it is, should be able to move up and down and colonize, colonize a different part of the body as well. So when you're talking about bacteria, of course, and if you're talking about parasite as well, then you're talking about uh, so many type of organisms. And of course, let's not forget about the fungi and viruses as well. So medical microbiology is the study of causative agent of infectious diseases of humans and their reaction to such infection. So you get infected and of course your body react to it. And one of the reaction is fever and of course difficulty in breathing and of course death is also one of the reaction of infected when when somebody is infected by infectious uh, diseases um branches of medical microbiology we have bacteriology the science of bacteria the causative agent of the member of the infectious diseases we have virology so that is the science of viruses non-cellular living system capable of causing infectious diseases in man. And then we have myco mycology, the study of fungi, pathogenic for man. And then protozoology, we have, which deals with pathogenic unicellular animal organism. And then we have helminthology, is the study of parasitic worms, uh, so-called helminths. So those are the branches of medical microbiology. So let's now try to see the size comparisons of microbes. Um, uh, the basic unit of length is meter and all other units are fraction of a meter. So a nanometer is 0 0.00000001 meter. Asante. So uh, micrometer, of course, is the, of course, a nanometer is 10 power 9, power minus 9. A micrometer is 10 minus 6. A millimeter is 10 minus 3. A meter is 39.4 inches. So this units of measurement corresponds to units in an older but still widely used convention. One angiostone is 10 power minus 10 meter one micron is 10 power minus six meters so these are very important uh, measurement okay so when you look at that um we are able to realize how small some of the organisms are for example and 
adult uh, roundworm, which is a hell myth, is around <clears throat> around uh, uh, 10 millimeter. So this one can be seen, but you really need to struggle, but still you should be able to see with your eye. And then there are smaller organisms such as uh, the yeast, which you, of course you'll need a magnification to see. And then the bacillus still, and of course the Chericha coli and mycoplasma. As you realize that the sizes become smaller and smaller. But there are those that you can see with the light microscope and those that you cannot see even with the light microscope that is in our lab. Viruses are quite smaller, so you require to use an electron microscope so that you'll be able to see it and be able to uh, uh, identify it in that order. So the size, it, it, it comes out so uniquely that microorganisms as they are known, they are quite small. They cannot be seen, most of, most of them cannot be seen with a naked eye. And of course, some of the parasite, the helimins can be seen with a naked eye because some of them are quite large. So let's look at the differences between, I think this one you learned in high school, the difference between eukaryotic cell and prokaryotic cell. So what's the difference between a eukaryotic cell and a prokaryotic cell? One of the differences that you can see on the picture, on the slide, is that, uh, of course, in terms of uh, uh, structure, they are quite different. And this is a task I'll give you. I want you to take time and see and see for yourself what's the difference. But one difference that is coming out clearly is that when you look at the nucleus of both, uh, one of the organism has a nucleus that is quite defined. One of course has a nucleolus and a nucleus, and the nucleus is centrally placed and is well defined. That is a eukaryotic cell. But on the other side, the nucleic material are quite not uh, surrounded, of course, by the nucleic, uh, nucleus membrane, as you can see. So it's just a thread that is within the central part of the, of the prokaryotic cell. And the prokaryotic cell, for this case, it is a bacteria. And the eukaryotic cell, of course, uh, it's a human cell and other cells of the fungi, and protozoa and other organisms. Prokaryotic is specifically a bacteria. So you realize that the prokaryotic cell is quite still primitive in, in that it is still yet to have developed fully. Like you don't have a mitochondria in the prokaryotic cell. And that tells us that uh, it has quite have to use other ways of utilizing energy and breaking up energy so that the cell can be able to function normally. I want you to read more and remind yourself the differences between a eukaryotic cell and a prokaryotic cell. And of course, list them and then be able to understand what really are the differences. Microbiological nomenclature. In microbiology, the binomial system of nomenclature is accepted where each species ha each species has a generic and a specific name. The generic name is written with a capital letter and the specific name with a small letter. For example, anthrax bacillus, it is called bacillus anthracis. A tetanus bacillus is called clostridium tetani. So those are the way that we give that we give names to this microorganism. So when we're looking at the bacterial cell structure, which is a prokaryotic cell, uh, it is quite adapted in that it has a pili and the pili has a function. And one of the function of the pili is for attachment. Another one is the flagellum. The flagellum helps it to move up and down. Um, when you look at the cell envelope, of course, has its function. The cell wall has its function. The capsule, it has its function. One of the things that we're going to discuss is the specific uh, adaptation that the 
bacterial cell has ad has evolved to be able to cause disease in man it has because when looking at the capsule the capsule helps it to be able to evade phagocytosis so it means that once it has been phagocytosed so long as the capsule is there then it cannot be broken down once it has been phagocytosed so let's look at uh, let's continue looking at classification of medical organisms of course bacteria are classified by their group gram stain characteristics gram staining is the application of cryovilet dye to a culture of bacteria so bacteria that retain the color of the dye are called gram positive and bacteria that don't are called gram negative gram stain attaches to the peptidoglycan layer in the bacterial cell wall. so in the gram negative bacteria the peptidoglycan layer is protected by an outer membrane which makes it to be able not to retain the color so that makes the difference between gram positive bacteria and gram negative bacteria let's look at it at a microscopic level gram positive bacteria in terms of it is structure and gram negative bacteria in terms of it is wall structure so remember that uh, we are just looking at the cell wall of the bacteria and this is how it looks like the tachyoic acid and the uh, when you're trying to look let's just look uh be, we are interested in the in the uh, peptoglycan layer when you're looking at it actually it is thinner on the gram negative and thicker and the gram positive so which makes it have the ability to retain the stain and be able to uh of course be able to uh stain as it is going to stain so let's look at bacterial shapes that helps us to identify different bacteria the cocci the cocci are spherical in nature uh, of course one of the cocci is staphylococcus aureus and another one is streptococcus pneumoniae which causes pneumonia in children Streptococcus pyogenes, which causes uh, such problems as uh, wound problem. The bacilli, which are rods in nature, an example is the Bacillus anthracis and Haemophilus influenzae. When you look at the color, you should be able to see that the gram positive bacteria look differently compared to gram negative. Curved or spiral, we have Vibrio cholerae and then Borrelia burgdorferi. So these are the bacteria in terms of shape and in terms of the color uh, that after staining. Remember, we talked about how they be able to adapt and look after staining. When you look, remain when we just remind ourselves uh, about gram staining is that uh, one of the interesting uh, dye that we interest we are interested in is the crystal violet uh, dye um and the outcome so the bacteria that retain the color of the dye are called gram positive and bacteria that don't 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 are gram negative so we now know how they why they're able to look like that viruses Viruses are acellular obligate intracellular organisms and the complete infectious virus is called a virion. The virion consists of specific nucleic acid, DNA or, R or RNA, surrounded by a protein coat called a capsid. Some viruses are enveloped, which means that they possess a lipoprotein coat that surrounds the capsid and is acquired from infected host cell membrane. Of course, an example of this virus is HIV virus and coronavirus. So viruses that lack an envelope are called naked. And these viruses are the major cause of foodborne illnesses that we be able to go and learn more, especially the nutritionists who are going to be very interested in this because when you're talking about foodborne illnesses, 
and we'll be studying food microbiology. We'll be quite discussing a lot as far as envelope viruses are concerned. Example of naked viruses, of course, are hepatitis C, which is a major cause of foodborne illnesses. And um, and other viruses that we're going to discuss in later part of uh, our discussion. So viruses are typically classified by genetic material, either DNA virus or RNA viruses. They can also be classified in terms of strandedness, either single strand or double strand. We also can classify them in terms of size and shapes of the capsid and whether it is enveloped or non-enveloped. Our, we can also classify them in terms of method of replication, such as the virus that has a reverse transcriptase enzyme and the virus that don't have a reverse transcriptase enzyme. And in this case, these are RNA viruses. So envelope viruses versus env and envelope viruses. So let's look at non-envelope viruses. Example, we have papilloma virus and uh, adenovirus. Those are non-enveloped but double-stranded viruses and DNA in that case. We also have double-stranded RNA virus such as Rio virus in the class in the class of Rio viridae. And then we have single-stranded RNA viruses such as Kaleki virus, Picanovirus, uh, Picanoviridae uh, uh, is an uh, exemplified by poliovirus. Remember, these are single-stranded RNA viruses. And we say all these viruses are naked and they are a major cause of foodborne illnesses. Remember, polio is transmitted through oral phycal route and is able to cause foodborne illnesses and Kaliki virus as well. Single stranded, we have another one, Pavoviridae, that causes erythema infectiosum. And all these viruses that are un un unenveloped, most of them cause foodborne illnesses. And of course, others don't cause such as papilloma virus, they don't cause foodborne illnesses. Adenovirus are not transmitted through oral phycal route, uh, but when you look at Kaliki virus, Kaliki viridae, so-called Norwalk viruses and polioviruses, uh, uh, they are able to be transmitted through the route of oral phycal route. Envelope viruses, of course, double-stranded, uh, when we are trying to look at them in terms of classification, we have double-stranded DNA, single-stranded RNA. So that is how they are able to be classified. And when you look at keenly the shape, it is quite unique in that order. So you can see there's a virus that causes rabies and how it looks like is single-stranded RNA. And then we have HIV virus that causes, uh, that is under the retroviridae. And then we have the bunyaviridae, that is the hunter virus. And then togoviridae, we have the rubella, rubella virus. Uh, paramyxoviridae, we have the measles virus. And then arena viridae, we have the lymphocytic Corio meningitis virus. And then you have coronaviridae. That is where we have coronavirus. I think this is quite interesting for all of us. So here is where the coronavirus is. So uh, I'll circle these two viruses because this is what um, we are discussing current. We are under currently. And of course, HIV virus is also one of the virus that will be very much interested in as well. So RNA viruses, classification of RNA viruses infecting vertebrates. We have the family Picanoviridae 
under picano viridae we have poliovirus and rhinovirus poliovirus is uh, a major cause of polio in children rhinovirus is a major cause of flu among uh, the people among humans and then kaliki viridae of course example are no rock virus uh, and many members that cause gastritis gastroenteritis togaviridae uh many might play in orthopod, orthopods orthopods and vertebrates and cause encephalitis in humans of course um there are so many i think get your time pass through them and read and understand i'm giving you a few minutes to pass through the slide and read and try to understand how they are classified DNA viruses I'll as well give you time to pass through but um I'll I'll be able to talk about a few of them uh, such as human papilloma virus that is associated with genital and oral carcinoma and up on my mouth is it so Huh? Okay, this baby is disturbing me. So, um, this one is quite interesting because when looking at DNA viruses, we have a partner viridae, which is a family, uh, and the virion structure contains lipid containing envelope. And one of the examples of the virus is hepatitis B virus. Hepatitis B virus is quite an interesting virus because this virus is transmitted through, uh, of course, sexual mode and through the blood. So these are blood-borne viruses. So this if means that these viruses are quite a big problem, especially among healthcare workers. And as we realize that uh, you students are going to be vaccinated against this virus because it's quite infectious. Uh, Pavoviridae, uh, um, are of course, naked viruses uh, are a major cause of outbreak of gastroenteritis following eating of shellfish. So these viruses are transmitted through uh, that mode. And then human, uh, when you're looking at Pavoviridae, such as papilloma, polyoma, and vacuolating agent, this is uh, it's a naked virus and contain circular double-stranded dna and causes a uh, human papilloma virus associated with genital genital and oral carcinoma uh, i was watching a documentary on uh, sti among the commercial sex workers and the commercial sex workers normally uh, in um, zimbabwe call uh, um, the, the genital Carcinomas uh, have been given a special name called ca so the cauliflower. So this means that the 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 cast there really looks like a cauliflower around the genital area. So this is a very major problem among commercial sex workers. So I want you to read more. I'll give you time to peruse through, and of course this slide is also available. On SlideShare, it's also available on uh, MLM, and you'll be able to pass through as you watch this video. So let's look at viral replication. When you're talking, looking at viral replication, we have DNA viruses that replicate inside the nucleus of the host cell, RNA viruses, replicating the cytoplasm of the host cell. Retroviruses, however, which are RNA viruses, they replicate in the nucleus of the host cell. So let's look at viruses, RNA viruses, 
for example, Zika virus. So Zika virus, this is the impact it's able to cause on the human being. It's called microencephaly, children in small heads, because it results in underdevelopment of the brain. So this virus is RNA, of course, it's going to replicate inside the, the cytoplasm. So it has specific receptors and it needs to penetrate the whole cell. Uh, so the viral RNA is released into the cell and the virus RNA uh, replication, uh, replication and go on. And then when you can see it, later on, you have protein synthesis taking place. And then we have the new viral particles that are sample and is transmitted through the rough plasmic reticulum and is, as, is escorted outside and new viruses are released from the cell. So being an RNA virus, it replicates inside the cytoplasm and transmitted, of course, to the outside uh, of the cell through the rough endoplasmic reticulum or endoplasmic reticulum for that way and through the gold gear apparatus so you realize that this replication of the dna of the rna of the virus the genome of the virus and this protein synthesis so that the protein can be able to the protein for this case are the capsid the capsid is proteinous in nature so it needs to be synthesized as well so once we have the genome of the virus, which is RNA, being having replicated, then it's assembled together with the protein and then escorted outside through the host cell mechanism, and that is the endoplasmic reticulum and the Golgi apparatus. So viruses, so what about DNA viruses? How do they replicate? That is a task I'll give you as a student so that you'll be able to go and find it on yourself how do they so i want you to go and search how the replicative cycle of dna viruses are then be able to come out with that in your individual portfolio function the fungi the fungi all fungi are chemoheterotrophs and pathogenic fungi have two forms yeast which is unicellular mold which is multicellular some fungi are dimorphic this is particularly true for the pathogenic fungi meaning that they 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 exist as multicellular but once they are inside the host cell they exist as unicellular so molds grow as filamentous branching strands connected cells known as hyphae so let's look at look at the route of entry of most of those fungi they can go and they can come to your body through the nasal synapses by inhalation whereby once in one person inhales the spores the spores will be able to go within your system and uh, start replicating there as you cell. We remember we talked about fungi growing as a dimorphic fungi. So in the normal environment, should those land on, um, on an, uh, an environment other than the human environment where the temperature are 37 and above, when the temperature are 25 and below, they'll go and grow as mold. But once they are inhaled and they realize that the temperature here is 37, then they'll grow as yeast and multiply by budding. So then they can go to the lungs, blood vessels, esophagus, of course, stomach, intestine. And of course, we have somewhere where they can, uh, where this fungi grow on the skin. So these are different parts of the ports of entry where these fungi are able to uh, attach themselves and grow them. So they, 
can affect the nasocinesis, of course, through inhalation. They can go to the lungs. They can go to the blood vessel. They can go through the esophagus, stomach, intestine, and skin. They can even affect the brain, lungs, heart, spleen, liver, kidney. But we also have a cutaneous mycosis. That is the fungi that grow uh, superficially on the skin, hair, and nails. And then you have cutaneous within the skin, hair, and nails, Within the skin and hair and nails and subcutaneous beneath the skin. So what's the difference? Superficial. Uh, cutaneous mycosis. So of course, when you're talking about that, uh, it it's just affect the cuticles. Superficial, of course, it is not uh, invoking any nervous response, but Cutaneous, of course, you'll be able to feel the, the irritation the fungi is, affect, is being able to cause on your skin. And then subcutaneous, of course, is beneath the skin. And that means that it has to be implanted traumatically through, of course, the prick where the fungi is growing. When you step on a need on a, a prick, uh, on a sharp object and the fungi is growing on that sharp object, then the fungi will be able to be implanted within your system within the subcutaneous or beneath the skin. So let's talk about parasite. So parasites, we have a unicellular and multicellular parasite. Um, the unicellular are protozoa, the multicellular are metazoa or the helminths. So let's look at the unicellular, the protozoa. So we have the sacodina, which is the amoeba, this, uh, and of course, sporozoa, mastigophora, which are the flagella, the ciliata, which are the ciliates that have the cilia. So the cilia are the uh, those things, that the projection, the many projections that are on the surface. The flagella is the long uh, uh, extension that you can see towards the appendages of the of the protozoa. But the sporozoa, they have none. And the sporozoa includes the plasmodium, such as plasmodium malariae. Pseudopods, they have what you call <clears throat> a false feet that helps them to grow. So when you're looking at multicellular the helminths, we have the nematohelminths and platyhelminths. Platyhelminths are the flat womb, and nematohelminths are the round worms. Trematodes, we have the flux. And at the platyhelminths, we have the trematode and the cestode. And at the cestode, we have the tepu. And at the trematode, we have the flux. So basically, when you're talking about parasites, you're talking about a diverse group of organisms. So let's look at the protozoa. Type of protozoa. Type of parasites. A protozoa single cell a microscopic organism that can perform all necessary function of, of metabolism and reproduction. We have the rhizopoda, the ciliata. You see the cilia extension still growing on them. So these are the cilia. The flagella, it should have uh, a flagella to, at the end, either two or several. The sporozoa, they don't have any, any, they don't need to move up and down. They have their special adaptation. For example, when I talked about plasmodium malariae, um, that means that uh, such parasites don't need to move. Of course, they should be able to have their own ways of being able to affect the, uh, the body. Of course, the, they affect the red blood cells. So when I talked about the flagellum, I think Euglena has one. And then uh, Paramecium also has uh of course have some ciliates that you cannot see uh, amoeba has the ability to form the four feet and that is uh, the rhizopoda <laughs> let's look at the helminths helminths are a large multicellular organism that is generally visible to the naked eye in its adult stages helminths can be free living or parasitic we have the nematodes, which are roundworm, trematodes, which are flux, cestodes, which are tapeworm. So this is how they look like. So whipworm, 
human people, we have the female and male. Ascaris, I think that is how they look like. Pinworm, that's how they look like. Uh, we have the bovine tapeworm and pork tapeworm. The bovine